Welcome to the fifth, the fifth session in our Bertelsmann Transformation Series, organized in partnership with our cousins at the Bertelsmann Stiftung in Germany, Democracy in Africa, the Center for Democracy and Development, and the Institute for Public Opinion and Research in Malawi. Thank you all for joining us via Zoom, and to those tuning in on our Facebook live stream, uh, we're delighted to have you all here. I'm Tony Silberfeld, the Director of Transatlantic Relations at the Bertelsmann Foundation in Washington, and I'll be the moderator for today's session titled Africa's New Leaders, Changing the Guard or Changing Systems. The driving force behind this session is the Bertelsmann Transformation Index, which examines the changing political and economic dynamics across 44 countries in Africa. Today, we'll provide a regional overview and shine a spotlight on three countries in particular, Nigeria, Malawi, and Zimbabwe. We have lots of ground to cover in the next hour, so let me start by introducing the experts who will guide us along the way. In just a moment, you'll hear from my colleague, Robert Schwartz, who will give you a brief primer on the Bertelsmann Transformation Index. Then we'll turn the floor over to Nick Cheeseman, Professor of Democracy and International Development at the University of Birmingham. Nick is also the author of the BTI's regional report on Sub-Saharan Africa. So we'll kick off this discussion with a look at those results. From there, we'll turn our attention to Nigeria and Edia Hassan, Director of the Center for Democracy and Development. Then we'll head to Southeastern Africa for an update on Malawi from Bonifaz Dulani, senior lecturer at the University of Malawi in Zamba. Rounding out today's panel will be a look at Zimbabwe with Dr. Chipo Dendere, professor of Africana studies at Wellesley College. It's a pleasure to have you all here and I look forward to your remarks. Once we've heard from our speakers, we wanna bring all of you into the conversation as well. So at any point, please feel free to submit a question to the panelists using the Q&A function on your Zoom toolbar. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as time will allow. So with that, I thank you again for being here and I'll turn the floor over to Robert. Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you for your kind introduction, Tony, and welcome to all of you. Many of you joined via the networks of our friends and partners from CDD Nigeria, i Malawi, the platform Democracy in Africa and others. Uh, so allow me to spend just a minute uh, introducing the Bertelsmann Transformation Index to our new audience, uh, who we are, what we do, and why we do it. Let me start with the last one. Why do we analyze transformation processes in Africa and worldwide, actually? Of course, every national transformation experience is different. Successful and sustainable transitions toward democracy and toward an inclusive economy are rare and precious and they cannot simply be repeated thousands of miles away. At the same time, we observe that conditions and windows of opportunity resemble each other at times, even in the most unlikely places. For societies striving to become more open, more just and more inclusive, there are so many lessons to be learned from successes and failures elsewhere. With the BTI, we track these unique transformation experiences since the early 2000s, and we make these local and often little known experiences accessible to any reform-minded government, opposition, or civil society across the globe. Learning from each other is not optional. Autocrats and oligarchs around the world surely emulate each other's most effective strategies of staying in control. Reformers should be able to do the same for the common good. And they need tools, methods, and independent analysis to do so. Wherever the BTI can make a modest contribution to tipping the momentum in favor of pro-democracy forces, we consider it a great achievement. In order to do so, the BTI must be more than just an index made of, of composite rankings. Of course, the BTI is first and foremost an index, a comprehensive one that assesses uh, political transformation toward democracy, economic transformation toward a fair and socially inclusive economy, and the performance of uh, decision makers, aka governance. These three dimensions consist of 17 components, which are in turn made up by 49 subcomponents or indicators. Don't worry, I'm not going to start naming and describing any of these 49 indicators in more detail. Uh, for those of you who would like to know more, I'll be posting a link to our methodology section um, in the chat. Um, but as I said, the BTI is also more than just an index. In order to track complex transformation processes, making them comparable and applicable, providing scores and rankings is not enough. 
We need in-depth qualitative information on the factors that contribute or harm societal transformations. Therefore, every two years, we put standardized and in-depth reports for 137 countries on the table, freely accessible on our website, bti-project.org. And we provide a space for cross-country knowledge sharing and exchange, such as this webinar we're having right now. Last but not least, the BTI is teamwork. It is the result of a collaborative effort of more than 300 experts worldwide, led by a small project team of the nonprofit Bertelsmann Stiftung in Germany. Every country is covered by at least two specialized country experts working independently from each other. That makes 280 country experts in total. Among them, there are close to 100 for Africa alone. Two of them are actually with us today, Nick Cheesman and Boniface Dulani. Um, the reports and ratings um, by country experts make up the core of the BTI. In addition, we rely on 10 regional coordinators. They are the backbone of standardization, calibration, and quality control of quantitative and qualitative assessments. They also write up comprehensive regional reports. At this point, allow me to acknowledge the hard work of our four Sub-Saharan African coordinators for West, Central, Southern, and Eastern Africa, namely Matthias Basedau, Charlotte Heil, Sigmar Schmidt, and Julia Renner. In order to combine sub-Saharan transformation experiences across sub-regions, uh, we asked Nick Cheesman for the second time uh, to round up the most striking political, economic, and governance features in one continental report. Not an easy task, but Nick is getting used to it. Uh, the recent reporting period is a particularly interesting one. We have seen a larger than usual number of leadership changes at the top, so naturally the question arises to what extent these power transitions have contributed to actual systemic change in African nations. This is also why we asked Boniface, Chipo, and Idaya to join us today. Their countries, Malawi, Nigeria, and Zimbabwe, have seen significant leadership changes in recent years. Without further ado, I'm looking forward to an insightful discussion and hand over back to you, Tony. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. I appreciate you setting the table for us. Um, we're gonna turn our attention over to Nick, who's gonna share his screen with us, and we'll get us into the results of the BTI report. Nick, it's all yours. Nick, you're still on mute. So, uh, yeah, so Robert said that I was getting used to writing the reports, but clearly not getting used to using Zoom, uh, despite the numerous meetings we've been having. So, first of all, thanks to everyone for joining us. It's great to have your presence. And to our stellar, fantastic panel, thanks for giving up your time. I think this is going to be a really great discussion. Now, Robert's already kind of foregrounded some of the key things that we'll be talking about today. There's been a lot of leadership change over the last 10 years. In some cases, we've been talking about changes of leader, as in Robert Mugabe going in Zimbabwe, but the same party is in power. In other cases, we're talking about a change of party. In Malawi, we've just seen an opposition victory in dramatic circumstances. And one of the questions we'll be getting at today is how much does change really occur after leadership or party change? Do we get maybe too excited when we see someone at the top go and forget about all of the constraints, the structural challenges, the dynamics that actually encourage leaders to behave in that way and that mean that we often see more continuity than change? If we actually look at the BTI report, which basically goes from 2017 to 2019, so please remember that the report itself and the data itself don't cover this year. So any changes that have occurred recently will not be covered in the data, they'll be captured in the next report. If we look at that period of the BTI, we see two interesting things. The first is that at the continental level, if we take the 44 countries in Africa covered by the report together, there is really very little change in the average quality of democracy. And that will surprise some people because this has been a period in which a lot of us have talked about democratic decline, civil liberties being eroded. But what we actually see if we look at the numbers of the reports and the different country case studies written by different individuals is that actually increases in democracy in some cases are effectively wiped out by decreases in democracy in others. So we see quite a lot of movement at the country level, but when it comes to the average for the continent, we don't see so much movement overall. So I think that's an important reminder to us not to get overly focused on one or two cases that sort of set the media headlines and to keep our eye on actually what's happening across the board. 
And across the board, there's actually more continuity than there is change. And that might be a, a hint as to what I'm going to say in a minute about the extent to which leadership and party change in Africa has actually generated broader systemic political changes. But let me just show you what things look like. And I should say before I start that we're really going to focus today on the democracy element, particularly, I think, of uh, the BTI report, but we will stray into talking about the governance and the economic transformation as well. It's a very big report. There's a lot of detail on all of these different areas. And so I would encourage everyone to go to download the report free from the BTI website. It contains a lot more detail than we're going to be able to get through in this relatively short discussion. So please do keep that in mind. With that said, I would like to take you uh, to basically have a look at how does democracy look in Africa or how do African states look at when it comes to democracy. And what you can see basically is that we have relatively few countries that under the BTI classification are seen to be kind of almost perfect democracies consolidating, get since that incredibly high level. But we do have quite a lot of countries that BTI calls kind of defective democracies. They've got strong elements of democracy going on within the country, but significant limitations in one or two different areas. We've then got, you know, a set of highly defective democracies, moderate autocracies, and then hardline autocracies. And you can see that the two most common categories here are the kind of hardline autocracies, countries that in many cases, you know, it's not just that they uh, got to be democracies and then they've moved backwards. Some of these cases like Rwanda, Cameroon, Chad, Djibouti, never really became democracies in the first place. They transitioned from predominantly authoritarian military or one-party states and have maintained that authoritarian control despite holding multi-party elections. And that's still one of the most common categories of all of the categories we see within the BTI report. In terms of significant changes, the arrows up indicate countries that have moved up a category and the arrows down indicate a country that's moved down a category. So as you can see, one of the countries that was a big mover in uh, the BTI report was Kenya, which was really marked down because of the controversy around the flawed 2017 elections and the repression that followed that. And as a result, moved down two categories, hence the two arrows down, one of the biggest movers down. You can also see that some other countries moved up. For example, Ethiopia and Zimbabwe both moved up a category, reflecting the growing optimism around the world about the transitions in those countries. Abiy coming to power in Ethiopia, Menengagwa coming to power in Zimbabwe. And in both of those cases, the reflection, the, the, the optimism amongst the media, amongst some of the international community, was reflected in the initial BTI scores, and as you can say, see reflected here. But one of the things I also wanted to point out is that actually the vast majority of countries here do not have arrows next to their name. And what that means is they haven't moved category in this round of the BTI score, 2017 to 2019. So as I said at the beginning, while we're going to emphasize some of the key changes and some of the countries in which the biggest changes have occurred, one of the things I also really want to emphasize here is continuity. We actually see a lot of countries like Mauritius and Botswana that have been consolidating democracies for a long time. We see a lot of authoritarian states in that far right-hand category that have been authoritarian states for a long time. And in these two sets of categories, the real feature is continuity, not change. I would argue that many of those authoritarian states are staying roughly where they are or becoming incrementally more repressive. Those sort of consolidating democracies are probably staying roughly where they are and slowly consolidating. In a lot of these categories, we are not actually seeing radical rapid change. So the kind of media depiction we sometimes get of rapid changes in African politics is sometimes overstated. Let's focus on those countries that have really shifted one way or another when it comes to the democracy rating of the BTI 2017 to 2019, like I said. We've got four countries where we see really significant improvements, uh, in not in all cases massive improvements, but significant improvements in the quality of democracy. These are Angola, Ethiopia, Sierra Leone, and Zimbabwe. We've got four cases, uh, sorry, six cases where we see declines, Cameroon, Chad, Guinea, Kenya, Tanzania, and Zambia. It's important to emphasize that the declines in Guinea and Zambia were relatively small in nature, but there'd already been a period of decline in both of those cases. The real significant declines over this period came, for example, in Cameroon, where, of course, the Anglophone crisis and the repression under the president um, has increased. In Kenya, as I mentioned, where we saw 
that's a problematic election. And of course, in Tanzania, where there's been a significant erosion of political liberties under President John Magafuli. What I really wanted to emphasize here, though, is if we look at on the up, the quest countries that have significantly moved towards democracy over this period of time, they're basically all cases in which we've seen a change of leader. In Angola, we saw a long time president moving down and a new president coming in with a new reform agenda and moving against corruption, of course, famously with the prosecution um, and you know, recovering some of the assets of Isabel dos Santos, who previous president's daughter who had controlled significant parts um, of the uh, Angolan uh, oil and petro state. Uh, in Ethiopia, we have the rise to power of Abiy proclaiming that he's going to be a reformer, and not only that, but winning the Nobel Peace Prize for reopening negotiations with Eritrea, forming a peace deal there, releasing political prisoners, and committing himself to free and fair elections. Uh, Sierra Leone and Zimbabwe, you know, very similar, and I'm not going to talk about Zimbabwe because Chipo is going to come up and do a much better job of that than me. So in a lot of these cases, the optimism that we see in the report is directly related to a change of power, not to an existing government reforming, but to a new leader or a new political party. And one of the questions I really want to push us on today is do we get far too excited and optimistic about the first round of a leadership change in a country? And the reason to think that we possibly do is that, of course, changing a leader doesn't of itself change anything about the system. That leader then needs to be committed to a system of reform thereafter. And the change of leader doesn't necessarily change the key veto players or blocks that are preventing reform. For example, in Zimbabwe, the change to Munangagwa did not actually remove uh, the military from power. If anything, the role that the military played in removing Robert Mugabe and allowing Emerson Munangagwa to take power consolidated the military's political significance. Um, similarly, in some of the other cases, if we were to look at Ethiopia, the challenges that had faced previous leaders in Ethiopia prior to Abiy taking power were still there. Localized violence, uh, intense possibility of unrest around elections, controversy around elections and how they should be held and when under COVID they should be held, uh, the difficulty of managing the EPRDF coalition, the fact that when he created his own political party, he lost uh, the Tigray part of uh, the EPRDF and now faces a fractured ruling elite. All of these challenges that in a sense had always been present are ever more so present under Abbey in the context of the coronavirus and his increasing difficulty in managing unrest and maintaining political stability. So the fact that we have a leader in Ethiopia who won the Nobel Peace Prize doesn't necessarily tell us very much about how easy he's going to find it to manage those tensions and whether he's going to have to revert to repression and authoritarianism in order to do so. Similarly in Zimbabwe, the fact that we have a new leader didn't actually tell us very much about the underlying political situation and in some ways you could argue it got worse rather than better. This shouldn't be a surprise to us, right? Because actually almost every generation, we see new leaders lauded both within Africa and internationally as being the next big thing. A classic example was, for example, President Museveni, who when he was elected promised that he would not overstay. He criticized leaders who continually shifted the constitution to give themselves more terms in office. He was explicitly critical about leaders around Africa who had not followed the rule of law. And yet President Museveni has now not only removed term limits, he's removed age limits to allow himself to stay in power. But it wasn't just Museveni. Museveni took power following a long Bush war, most of which was against the government of Milton Obote. Obote was also a leader that was celebrated both domestically and internationally because he, of course, replaced Idi Amin, whose regime had been chaotic. Amin, though, it's important to remember, was actually a transition that was celebrated. There were supposed to be parties in the streets in Uganda because Amin promised to bring order. There was also an idea that the British government and others around the world celebrated Amin, who they thought was one of them, having trained him themselves. So a succession of leaders have been lauded as a potential savior and then found wanting. And I think one of the things that means we really need to look at is what is the underlying set of power relations going on in each country, focusing less on the leader and more about the situation they have to manage. Now I'm at risk of talking too long, so I'm going to wrap up and lead in to the excellent speakers we have to follow. And the way I'm going to do that is by pointing out that as much as we've talked about general trends, and it's sometimes useful to do that, it also masks an awful lot. 
And when it comes to democracy, and many of you have heard me speak before, well, no, I say this every single time, there simply is no one Africa when it comes to the democratic experience. And there's many ways that we can break this down. In previous reports, I've kind of broken it down into democratic laggards and democratic leading lights and talked about the real spectrum of democracy in Africa. In this report, we do it regionally. So what you can see uh, in the figure, hopefully, that you can see now is that you can see Central and East Africa really down the bottom, starting a bit lower in terms of when the BTI starts in 2005-06, but declining a little bit from a peak in 2006-2007. West Africa actually getting more democratic over time and rising. Southern Africa dropping a little bit, but still staying fairly high. And what we have right now is roughly the same level of democracy on average in Southern and West Africa, fairly high compared to the bottom of the table where we see relatively low levels of democracy in East and Central Africa. So one of the things we need to keep in mind is that not all of the countries we're gonna hear from now are in the same neighborhoods. Some of them are in neighborhoods where almost every country nearby is a deeply authoritarian state that's generating political instability because for example, it's a civil war. Think of Central Africa, where we have a number of countries in the midst of civil conflict, combined with a number of former rebel governments in power, highly authoritarian, that's a very different environment to become a democracy than, for example, West Africa, where there's less former rebel leaders in power, there's more democracies, and of course, ECOWAS, for all of its failings, has pushed democracy in countries like Gambia. So it's important to keep in mind that we see these really very different democratic transitions. And one of the key points that we make in the report is that actually there's some evidence of increasing widening. Southern Africa, for example, uh, increased in terms of the quality of democracy on average last time around. West Africa, a small decrease, but as you can see, a really significant decrease there in Central Africa. So in some ways, the regions that have been historically troubled when it comes to democracy seem to be continuing to decline. And the regions that historically have done a little bit better, Southern and West, seem to be holding their position. So the prediction that we might make if we were to make one for next time round in the BTI report that we'll give you a year or two uh, hence, is that actually this divergence is not likely to conform on a uniform experience. In fact, we're actually likely to see greater diversity and variation within Africa moving forwards. So that's the final thought I'd like to leave you with. Um, and I hope now that we've set up the idea of these regional patterns of variations, which should lead really nicely into three talks coming up that will take you to those different regions and unpack some of these questions about leadership and structural political change in much more detail. Thank you very much. Nick, thanks very much for that presentation. I don't think we could have asked for a better overview uh, on the state of democracy in Africa and also a really nice segue into our speakers. Um, so I want to turn to our first speaker, uh, Idiot Hassan in Nigeria. Idiot, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, um, and thank you, Mick, for ending on a positive note, particularly from West Africa. Um, until the 1990, democratic rule likely failed to take root in West Africa, but now periodic elections are now in norm, with alternation of power witnessed in the last five years in Ghana, Nigeria, the Gambia, Benin, uh, Benin Republic, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea-Bissau, Coup d'etat are now a thing of the past. And in fact, as we love to say it in the region, we say that we say no to unconstitutional change of government. However, this leadership changes or democracy itself, how it has reflected in the lives of citizens is a different ball game entirely. Especially within this region where democracy means to people the delivery of public goods and services in terms of water, electricity, good roads, that's how we put, and more and more people are interrogating it by looking at civil rights now, especially looking at what, is, what has happened in the region um, in the last uh, five years in particular. So speaking to the topic, I'll be using Nigeria to, uh, as an example. In 2015, we had a change in government and we had one of the most peaceful and well-run election, um, well-run election since the return to democracy in 1999. The incumbent president, Muhammad Buhari, was voted into office on this change mantra itself. 
He represented change because his predecessor was deemed to have performed woefully, particularly in the fight against corruption and the Boko Haram insurgency ravaging the northeast of the country. However, when you look at the five years of Buhari and his change mantra, which was actually captured around three uh, cardinal points, which is economy, insecurity, security, and fighting corruption itself, you can see if really there is actually change. On corruption, of course, Buhari made notable achievements in terms of the increase in the numbers of assets seized, the number of convictions recorded, was more than his predecessors. He introduced some innovative approaches in the fight against corruption by setting up commissions. So there were and some notable appointments that he actually made. But looking at it holistically, you find that this is actually a mixed bag. As the president referred to as May Gaskia, that is the truthful one, was seen during the 2019 elections campaigning with kleptocrats. In his cabinet are several kleptocrats, and at the same time, he has refused to implement some serious reforms, such as the uh, decline of assets to the Auditor General's bill, which could have actually facilitated a lot of um, uh, changes in the fight against corruption itself, a systemic change in the fight against corruption. And on the Corruption Perception Index, in the last five years, Nigeria has not fared well. And one of the reasons also is the absence to the rule of law, of the rule of law in prosecuting the fight against corruption. Now, directly coming from the rule of law, we, I want to speak to the issue of civil rights, which on the BTI uh, index, Nigeria ranks uh, four, really. And this is actually comparable to all the other indexes. So if you look at Freedom uh, House Index, we are also five out of seven there. And all this, when you put it together and look at the last 21 years since the return to democracy, civil rights seem to actually have worsened since the coming into office of President Muhammadu Buhari, who campaigned on this uh, change and with so much euphoria from different, not just Nigerians, holding parties, but our friends in the international community. The numbers of extrajudicial killings has risen. Um, I think in the last three months, we have people who have been incommunicado in prison. Just this week, a singer is to be, has been sentenced to death in Kano for singing the praise of a person more than that of the prophet uh, of Islam itself. We go again and we look at the management of diversity uh, and you find that there are challenges, particularly the rise of nationalism in the Southeast uh, of the country with the Biafra secessionist agenda. Insecurity itself is prevalent in different parts of the country and that takes you to statism because there is an absence of, a spa of, of the states. The ungoverned spaces seem to have risen more and more. So Boko Haram insurgency, hedges and farmers conflict, kidnapping, hand banditry. On daily basis, at times you find like a hundred people are killed, 80 people are killed. Catching up with the numbers of deaths on daily basis itself has become a challenge. Even within the coronavirus, the number of people, pandemic, the number of people killed by the security um, agents were put at 18 during just the lockdown. Um, and then the coronavirus has killed only 12 people. Quite interesting. Now on the economy, when you look at the BTI itself, it rates Nigeria 3.9 on economic transformation. This is not far from the truth. Uh, a reality when you look at it that presently the country sits at 157 out of 188 on the Human Development Index, and that is slightly lower compared to previous years. In fact, we are judged the poverty capital of the world. The whole euphoria of change seems to have largely diminished among Nigerians and our friends in the international community. But the critical question to actually be asking here is, what is generating change and how do we see change? And for me, I still want to drill down to the BTI Continental Pro, uh, paper authored by Nick uh, Chisman. And I think he made two very fundamental points there. One is the fragility of democratic institution and the personalization of power within the individual who occupies the executive means that leadership change is typically seen to be necessary 
for wider political and economic reform. The second assertion is that in reality, the scope of what individual leaders can and want to achieve is significantly constrained by the political and economic context within which they operate. So how do you characterize change in this instance when you put it back to Nigeria? The guard or the system? Yes, there are new actors, but systemic change actually requires systemic reform. And as this occurred in Nigeria, um, I beg to differ. And looking at several indicators, I want to argue that maybe President Buhari is not able to bring change. Of course, there are changes which are reflecting his individual leadership style, which predates, of course, the 1983 in his first coming, which you can see prevalence in the approach to civil rights. Civil rights. But there are also other fundamentals which may not actually have allowed change to happen or which has argued against uh, change. One is the Nigerian constitution itself, which could actually have led and answered the question of nationalism, statism, and other issues that is plaguing the country. The constitution since 1999 has undergone at least four alterations, but there has been no structural changes to that constitution that can effect change. The economy itself remains same in the sense that it remains a mono single economy based on oil, not different from the 1970s. The income generating regions or states remain Lagos, Kano, Rivers, and of course the Federal Capital Territory. There is no real improvement. There has been no fundamental changes compared to previous years, even predating the return of democracy. Newly introduced structures, accountability mechanisms, such as the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, the Independent Corrupt Practices Commission, even the strengthening of the Office of the Auditor General, are remains ineffective, not effective enough to, have been, to be classified as systemic evolution of society. When you go again and you look at the hands of government, both the legislature and the judiciary that are captured in the, in the, in the BTI index, for the judiciary, you find there has been no landmark Supreme Court judgment with which you can compare either Kenya or Malawi in this instance. But what we have actually seen in years has been more endemic corruption in the judiciary. And the new leaders continue to be tied to the same political structure of Godfatherism, or what political scientists will call the GAD. That is the ruling coalition of, of cultural, economic, and political leaders that occupy power in society. And these GADs have captured power in itself. So in conclusion, when you look at it, periodic elections, Change of guards does not actually equal democracy. And in reality, development to the people. So it remains what we call plus a change, plus a la même chose. So the more they change, the more things remain the same in Nigeria. And actually, the same reflects in West Africa, where you will find what is happening in, Gan in, in Guinea Conakry and Cote d'Ivoire to remain the same people who have campaigned against totemism, who have said that uh, the standards, they were meant to be underdog before they assumed office, but they have remained and become semi-autocrats since coming into office, with some even vying for power and no coup d'etat, but now there is a new form of coup d'etat, which is a constitutional coup d'etat by changing the constitution. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a really interesting analysis. And I, I'm definitely going to be coming back to you with a couple of follow-up questions as we get into that cycle. So thank you. I want to turn over to Boniface now uh, in Malawi for a perspective from there. Boniface? Thanks, Tony. Um, and, and thanks, Nick, and I think uh, uh, so our previous presenter. Um, I just wanted to focus on uh, the effects of leadership change and how uh, that really uh, impacts on the uh, transformation. 
Uh, looking at the 2020 uh, index report, I, I singled out a number of areas where Malawi uh, does really poorly. Uh, this includes anti-corruption policy where Malawi uh, is rated uh, a four. Uh, issues of efficient use of uh, state assets, again, uh, another low score for uh, performance of democratic institutions also really being rated poorly, as well as the prosecution of abuse of office. And I wanted to, I, I singled this out and wanted to link how leadership change, uh, recent leadership change in Malawi has highlighted uh, why I think this, some of these areas, uh, country like ours, scores really badly. And just to put that in context, Malawi had elections, uh, presidential, uh, legislative and local government elections in 2019 that were highly, highly contested. The incumbent, uh, Peter Mutarika at the time, won the presidential elections with just about 9% of the vote. In the aftermath of those elections, there was a lot of contestations over the legitimacy of the results. Um, the two top losing candidates decided to challenge uh, the results in court while civil society mobilized uh, thousands and thousands of Malawians to go on the streets to protest the management of the elections themselves, which the uh, you know, international observers uh, you know, had declared to be free and fair by and large. Uh, in, in February this year, the constitutional court ruled that uh, those elections were null and that the country should publish elections. Uh, and then we went through a period where there was a lot of uncertainty on whether we were going to have the elections uh, or not. And then uh, the president and the electoral commission appealed the decision of the electoral commission. But that made the Supreme Court so uh, rule that it uh, accorded the decision of the Supreme Court and the elections for the presidency should go ahead. And this, uh, you know, so happened within the context of. Uh, COVID-19 and brought on its own challenges in terms of campaigning uh, and messaging and whether it did the elections, even there were questions as well whether the elections should have gone ahead or not. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the elections did go ahead uh, on 23rd of June and the, uh, the opposition candidate, uh, the main opposition candidate, Lazla Sichakwera, emerged victorious and was seen as Malawi's uh, sixth president. So why do I give all this background? Now, going back to, to, to the 2020, uh, you know, Betterman's report, in, in its report, we see Maui is falling badly in a number of areas. And I'd like to put that to challenges of what uh, uh, you know, others would even contend that he, under the former government of Peter Mutarika, there was actually zero leadership. So not only the, the leadership was poor, but it was just completely uh, non-existent. And I think you know, what we have now seen after the departure of Peter Mutarika highlights, I think, the importance and the significance of leadership change. We've now seen and heard a lot of stories coming out really about the extent of state capture under the former, uh, the former, government. and that he, uh, this story is now revealing a president that was not in charge, uh, that was he, even he himself personally captured. So, if you hear stories about it, um, some people around the president, for example, using, um, using the privileges uh, of the president to import up to 60 metric, 60,000 metric tons of cement from Zimbabwe and Zambia bypassing, um, you know, bypassing uh, all taxes because this was imported under the name of the president, even though the former president himself has, has come out to say, look, I was not responsible for importation uh, of, of that cement. We've really also, you know, heard stories about state uh, organizations and parastatal agencies, the Malawi uh, Electricity Supply Commission, the Malawi Energy Regulatory Authority, the Malawi Communications Regulatory Agency, 
the whole is another state, I you know, instead security uh, agencies having been captured uh, by, by people that were there only to advance their own interest, uh, largely because the president, the former president, had adopted a kind of a hands off approach. We've also seen you know, state capture extending to all corners, you know, parliament, members of parliament voting for themselves, all sorts of allowances and, 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 and loans uh, that are being paid by, by the state. Uh, and now the state really being, uh, being forced to pay heavy costs because of the, the, the failures of uh, the, former, the former president. And the, indeed, this also extended to facing uh, to the responses to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic when it is in Malawi. Uh, so the government did try to introduce a number of regulations. These were simply ignored by the wider public. And indeed, um, when the government tried to impose a lockdown in May this year, this was met with, again, spontaneous demonstrations across the country, rejecting, I think, all measures that the former government tried to impose. Now, I, I say this because one also can contrast that with the, the COVID-19 response after the change uh, of the former government, because we have now seen the new administration of Lazarus Chakwere again, to bringing back more or less similar measures that were previously rejected to fight COVID-19, but now the wider public, uh, you know, beginning to accept that and indeed getting uh, wider public support even from civil society and the other sections of society, largely because of that change uh, in government. Indeed, uh, we've also seen, and uh, it would be interesting to see the next, I think, you know, version of the, the index report to see where we need to after these new changes, because we also see the, the new administration really focusing on a rule of law and making sure that all individuals uh, accused of corruption in the former government uh, should be prosecuted and indeed uh, empowered the anti corruption bureau, which the report does not acknowledge, uh, has not done a very good job with that because uh, of the political influence in that included uh, you know, putting in personnel uh, that were sympathetic to the ruling government as well as, you know, uh, denying the anti-corruption bureau the necessary resources for to enable them uh, to do the job. The, the report does also mention, I think, another important aspect of, uh, you know, the capture of civil society uh, organizations. And, uh, the report does acknowledge in the Malay context that civil society was actually infiltrated by pro-government, uh, pro-ruling party agents. And now again, you see the new transformation, uh, the new uh, the, the, the alternation of power, giving civil society a new lease of life to enable civil society leaders uh, to do their job without having to look over their shoulders about who was in them. Of course, the challenge now remains that it, because civil society has been emaciated for the previous six years, there are now challenges for civil society to recover itself and recover independence. But it, of course, it has also cost Malawi significantly in economic terms, as the report does acknowledge. Indeed, looking back, the former president, Peter Mutarika himself, did acknowledge that the demonstrations that took place between uh, following the contested elections of 2019, uh, between June 2019 and February this year, cost Malawi uh, around $85 million uh, in terms of lost business opportunities as shops, you know, businesses had to close because of the demonstrations. Now, again, you know, it's interesting that you have a leader critiquing uh, the demonstrations when uh, actually, the demonstrations themselves were a function of the failure of leadership because some of the demands that the demonstrators were making were required the president, uh, the former president Peter Mutarika, to take action, uh, you know, in response to the demands of the demonstrators in order to have enabled him 
uh, to uh, enable the you know everybody the demonstrators really uh, to get off of the streets. So over over overall, we hoping that he, the change of leadership in Malawi has given us an opportunity for a fresh start. But of course, in the previous, you know, in the previous you know, times when we've also had changes in the leadership, we've had similar expectations that the new government, the new leadership will take Malawi in a different and more positive direction, only to be disappointed. So while Malawi is celebrating the change of government and the whole, this change will lead to the strengthening of the country's demonstrations. It's perhaps too early to start demonstrating when you start celebrating it, given that the new government has only been in power for, for barely, I think, a month and, and the, a month and a half. So, you know, the next five years will be interesting to see whether change of leadership can bring about the kind of changes that can be transformative in terms of politics, in terms of the economics, uh, as well as in all other sectors uh, of life. So let me pause there and, uh, and, and get back to you, Tony. Thanks, Bonifaz. I appreciate you leaving us with a little glimmer of optimism as we, we transition into Zimbabwe, uh, who Nick, during his presentation, identified as being one of the countries that's on the up. So Chipo, I want to turn to you for a look at Zimbabwe. Um, thank you. So just to start off where um, Nick ended, and I've seen some questions already coming in on uh, the positive outlook that he shared about Zimbabwe. So the first important thing to note is that the shift from uh, Robert Mugabe after the coup to Emerson Nangagwa increased hope, right? Uh, so in 2017, 2018, the period leading up to the election, there was a, there was a sense among Zimbabweans that uh, things were starting to look up that the country was opening up. And so the good that has happened, so I'll start with the good that has happened since 2017. Uh, the first which is that the, any change in leadership is critical. In the Zimbabwean case, what this exposed was that the problem wasn't just Robert Mugabe. For the longest time, starting in 2000, almost every campaign by the opposition had been focused on Mugabe must go. So now that Mugabe has gone, but many of the challenges are remaining, it shows that the problem really isn't an individual, but a systematic failure within the leadership. So that was one important outcome. A second important outcome was that um, the, the rise in sort of social media and what I like to think of as citizen journalism, and it's curious to talk about this when we actually have journalists who've been arrested. But I think it's been really important that citizens have played a critical role in exposing corruption uh, within the government, within uh, city leadership, that citizens have been able to continue to demand change in a different space. Um, now, the challenges since 2017 and, and I'm not sure that it's fair to say that people were overly uh, jubilant because there was something to be jubilant, right? When somebody who's been in power for nearly 40 years leaves office, I think citizens have the right to be jubilant. But the challenge that came with that, and, and there's sort of dual things that happened in Zimbabwe. So Robert Mugabe left office and immediately after in February, Morgan Changre died. And so, you know, this, this created some fissures within the opposition. And so all of a sudden, the opposition, which had strengthened over the years, uh, suddenly becomes, uh, you know, really disorganized. Uh, this is the, the kind way of saying it, that you have the, the rise of, of Nelson Chamisa caused some serious internal problems. And now we've seen that, uh, you know, Kupe, who was part of the opposition, seems to be causing up to ZANU-PF. So we find ourselves at a point where Zimbabwe needs a strong opposition. There isn't a strong opposition. So it's unlikely that what happened in Malawi will happen to Zimbabwe anytime soon because there simply isn't a united opposition that will be strong enough to take out, um, to take out ZANU-PF, if you will. What we've also seen since 2017 is an open and further militarization of the state. And I say open and further because Zimbabwe has always been somewhat militarized. But unlike before 2017, right now we have the president uh, showing favor or regard for anyone that is tied to the military. So we have people with 
executive positions that are straight from the military. So the uh, deputy in the Minister of Health, in fact, the current Minister of Health, who's also the Vice President, is one of the two generals who was very active in the coup against Robert Mugabe. So there's this clear rewarding of military personnel that's happening in the country. Uh, during protests, we've seen that they've replaced the police with the military. Uh, that's something new, and it sets a, a really dangerous precedence for, uh, for Zimbabwe. And I think I'm speaking a little fast, but I think I only have uh, three minutes. Um, so we've seen more militarization in the executive and uh, even in, in security measures, right? So where the military has always been or used to be reserved for external issues, the military is now very active within the country. We've also seen, um, and I'm not sure that we're seeing more corruption or it's that people are talking about it more oftenly, but the numbers that I've seen floating around is that Zimbabwe is losing close to $1 billion every year uh, to corruption. And, and I think the president has been rewarding uh, particular corrupt individuals uh, like Tagire with the lucrative deals. So the new transport deal that they have, which rewards this individual who's really caught up in, in uh, problematic corruption. Um, and, and so we might actually think that there is some bit of stagnation in how the country has been dealing with corruption. And it might even increase, right, if the president feels beholden to these people that made his presidency possible, that will continue to see him giving handouts um, to those people. We've also seen that the protest space has been compromised. I'm not going to say limited because we're seeing that citizens are using new and creative ways to challenge the government, but the traditional protest space has been compromised by the military, but also because the, the opposition is really quite weak uh, and fragmented. Um, and we've also seen that the, the government continues to use, not just in Zimbabwe, but I think uh, across the region, we've seen that authoritarian governments are using the COVID crisis to strengthen authoritarianism. And so for those of you who follow Zimbabwean social media, you see that the current spokesperson for the government made some uh, argument a couple of days ago where he said that the failing economy in Zimbabwe could be linked to COVID. But you know, anybody who's followed Zimbabwe for years knows that that's ridiculous, right? So Zimbabwe is not in a recession. Uh, Zimbabwe's economy has been failing uh, fundamentally, like deeply over 20, 30 years, really, uh, if we look at it. And we've also seen that the COVID crisis, uh, so they've put in these new measures um, uh, where they, you know, the, the lockdown itself is undemocratic in the sense that they are asking people to be at home by 6 p.m., but that creates room for the government to use very... Uh, undemocratic measures to keep people in the house. So Emerson Nagawa is doing his very best to continue to constrain the political space, the limited political space that's there is becoming even more constrained uh, in Zimbabwe and COVID hasn't helped the situation in part because you know the, the health um, facilities are very weakened in Zimbabwe. And so instead of addressing the weakened health system, the government has responded with a lot more force against citizens. And I'll pause there because I know we're running out of time. Chibo, thanks very much. And it's, it's, it's my fault. Apologies to the speakers and to the audience as well. We packed a lot into a very short period of time, uh, really complex issues that we couldn't possibly cover in an hour, which has left us about five minutes or so uh, with, the, with the indulgence of the speakers, if we can go a little bit over time, I'd at least like to get through one round of questions. And, and my task here is a tricky one, in that we've had a lot of engagement from the audience, uh, both, via, both, both via email and online. So I want to try to package one question uh, into, uh, or package several issues into one question and give you each an opportunity to speak to it. Uh, Idiot, I'm going to start with you on this. And, and the question goes back to uh, Nick's presentation. And if you look at the trend lines around democracy in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, regardless of the level where they appear, whether they were highly, highly defective, consolidated democracies, they're relatively flat. And what we've seen in other sessions, other regional sessions, is there have been wide swings, much wider swings. And so I wonder from your perspective, Idiot, and for the others as well, if you've been thinking, begin thinking about this, 
is what are the shocks that could change the trajectory of these trends? Are we talking about just elections? I know Nick talks about leadership. Um, people have written in already about issues like climate, about technology, um, about COVID. So I wonder, Idiot, starting with you, are, are there any shocks that you can see that can disrupt the status quo, either for better or for worse? I think that there are actually positives, which my colleagues have also alluded to. And for me, I think I have three here, which is a active citizenry. The more active the citizens become, and the more they take their future into their hands, the more positive we will see in terms of shocks and better governance. So the quality of citizenship will actually define the quality of democracy. Now, COVID will actually be a game changer as well. And for COVID, it will either make or my government. If it's not on sitting, it's going to be cementing leadership. But when COVID, because we don't know what is going to happen with COVID, we are not seeing a thousand people die every day. But if push comes to shove and we experience something like that, it is going to effect a shock, either for good or for better. Now, technology is actually very key and it has proven to be very, very useful during COVID. So if you look at what happened in Zambia, the ability of people to actually organize without having to face the bullet of police, the young population, all these are shocks. There are positives that can actually effect positive changes in the region, on the continent, in sub-Saharan Africa. But COVID could actually cement or unseat um, governments too. Thank you for that. Uh, Boniface, can I turn to you for the same question? Yeah, thank you. I, I would agree with you that about the, the sustained citizen activism. I think that's really you know, very, very important. And we've seen that really have such a momentous impact in the Malawian context. Uh, but um, apart from that, I, I would still go back, I think, to leadership, especially a leadership that can come in and change the way we do things. And if, if those changes can be sustained over a period of time, it sets us, I think, on a path, to, you know, it sets some path of dependency and an example that the other future leaders can emulate. The problem we have, I think, in my view, is that we've had so many leaders that have done things the wrong way, and then the new ones come in and perpetuate, I think, the same, you know, the same kind of behavior. As a result, even the citizens don't expect anything different from their leadership. But if you can have a leadership that is transformative, and the, again, you know, that transformation, if it is sustained, then I think it can set the countries on a, on a different path. Thanks, Boniface. Chipo, to you now. I mean, you mentioned in your comments the role of social media in citizen journalism. Uh, you mentioned leadership changes. Can you talk a bit about what, what Zimbabwe might look like going forward with additional shocks to come? I think, uh, you know, Zimbabwe is in a very difficult uh, space. So because of COVID, the already weakened health system, I initially, and I think others, we assumed that with COVID, the government would be forced to invest in the healthcare system. And I know that political science don't often talk about this, but I'm very interested in what a uh, death of a young society does to democracy. And I think what we're going to see in Zimbabwe is more disrupted democracy as more and more young people are dying, uh, not just from COVID, but from, um, other illnesses that are not getting treatment. A good example is that, you know, we only had one um, radiotherapy machine over the weekend in the entire country, right? And there are reports coming out that over the weekend, a lot of people that need dialysis, and surprisingly in Zimbabwe, it's a lot of very young people that need dialysis, could not get dialysis. They could not get blood transfusions because blood transfusion, each pint of blood is about 140 US dollars, which is way above uh, you know, what people earn in Zimbabwe. So there were lots and lots of deaths uh, that some have been recorded, some have not been recorded. So I think over time, uh, those deaths have a huge impact on democracy. So death does two things, right? So obviously there's the exit of people because they're dead and so they can't participate in politics, but it's also that the process of their death as we saw with HIV, it weakens the people's ability to participate because families have become so focused on taking care of the sick. 
And so we're going back to a period where Zimbabweans are so focused on taking care of the sick that they might not engage in politics as they normally would or, or as they should, right, given uh, some of the opening that has happened because, um, you know, so many people are getting sick. Um, but that's just not something that we have good data on. Uh, and so I don't want to sound authoritative on that, but it's something that really concerns me that if the COVID crisis isn't resolved, uh, death is going to be an, a major blow to democracy in the coming months. Thanks, Shipo. Nick, I want to turn to you maybe for the last comment here. Um, taking into account the comments that our country experts have made, I wonder if you'll look into the crystal ball for us, because as you mentioned, I mean, none of what we see in the BTI 2020 takes into account COVID, um, just as one of the shocks. But I wonder if you can look forward and give some consideration to uh, what, what the report might look like in 2022. I think the first thing we're going to see is a decline in a number of countries. I mean, COVID, as a number of people have said, has been used as an excuse, uh, in particular to censor the media, and we've seen harassment of journalists increase in a number of countries, including democracies like Ghana, during the COVID period. So I think the attack on civil liberties, the general growing sense of unease, the number of people who are now unwilling to speak out against governments in a number of countries is increasing. And I think the next round of the BTI will reflect that. Um, of course, each of the countries that we're talking about will reflect that differently. The manipulation of the pandemic is being most uh, pernicious in countries like Zimbabwe and much less pernicious in countries like Ghana, which are more democratic. So to some extent, I expect the pandemic to actually widen the divide. Democracies will deal with the pandemic in a more open way. They will relax emergency powers more quickly. Authoritarian states will hold on to those emergency powers for longer and will enforce them more brutally. And so I do expect to see a bit of a divergence. In terms of the countries that we've talked about today, it's very interesting. Uh, I see in Nigeria, as Idiot says, a set of godfathers and oil politics and a history of that combined with the insurgencies in North and South that I think are quite intractable to be able to move quickly in terms of moving economic reform or democratization. And so I worry that Nigeria will be stuck roughly where it is for a good few years yet. Zimbabwe, I find it quite hard to see a really positive outcome in the next couple of years. Um, it's clear to me that you know, the solution has to be a way beyond ZANU-PF and the military political complex that has evolved under it, as Chipo talked about, but that has become so effective at targeting and harming and intimidating people that although, as Chipo says, the protests are there and they are effective and Zimbabweans Lives Matter is trending on Twitter, the government is quite effective at shutting people down, putting people in prison, you know, putting its biggest critics in jail and stopping them from speaking. So of the three countries that we have here, although I can see long-term change in all of them, and I think the people of all of these countries want change and will fight for change, it's Malawi why perhaps would be most positive for a couple of reasons. I mean, one, the actual transition in Malawi strengthened institutions. We saw the judiciary get stronger by demanding that the election be rerun. Whereas in Zimbabwe, actually democratic institutions got weaker during the transition because it was effectively a military coup that put Munengagwa in power, not a democratic process. But also if we look at Malawi, one of the things that struck me, and I'd be interested in whether Boniface would agree with this, is that you know, there's been a lot of criticism of President Chekwera since he's come in. The cabinet involved people who were related to each other. There weren't quite as many women in the cabinet as people had hoped for and so on. But he's also struck an interesting note. I mean, he's signing off his, his speech with things like, you know, I'm here to serve you, I'm ready to serve, I'm hoping to listen, I'm going to sit down with the youth and the people of Malawi to hear what they have to say and I'm going to then decide on what to do on the basis of that. That's a different tone of leadership and it at least indicates that some of the democratic gains might survive. I would suspect in a few years time we'll also have more corruption scandals because I think the systemic corruption is so great that it's hard to eradicate that quickly. But I think that in terms of Malawi's trajectory, in terms of strengthening institutions, it's the country that perhaps will sustain these democratic gains and will deal most effectively, for example, with COVID without actually relapsing into an authoritarian state response. So I could be completely wrong, but that would be my guess as to where we'll be in three years' time. Thanks, Nick. Um, I wanted to just turn to our, our guest. I know you mentioned Boniface in that last comment. Boniface, did you want to chime in? in response to any of Nick's comments there? 
Uh, uh, yes, actually, thanks, Nick, especially in terms of the importance of judicial independence, because the, uh, I think all the, 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 the transformation that has happened in Malawi would not have taken place if the judiciary had ruled in favor of the former regime. And indeed, I think there were several attempts to try and influence the judiciary to rule in favor of the former government, uh, including actually direct attempts to bribe the judges sitting in the constitutional court, but they stood firm. So I think that's key. But I think in addition, perhaps to what Nick has pointed out, and I think what stands Malawi in contrast with, say, Zimbabwe, is also the neutrality of our military in, in Malawi. Because we saw again uh, over the past year during the demonstrations, the military standing firm in defense of the protesters, even at the times when the government changed the leadership of the military at several points, uh, trying to bring in individuals that were seem to be sympathetic to the government, but it, the military remained neutral. And indeed, others would argue that it, it wasn't actually neutrality. They stood on the side of the people and the demonstrators and defended that right to demonstration. And I think that really contrasts with the, our colleagues in Zimbabwe, where the military has stood head and shoulders with the government and the and, and really suppressing, I think, the rights and the freedoms of ordinary citizens. Chipo, I want to turn to you. Does that does that uh, description resonate with you in terms of the comparisons between Malawi and Zimbabwe? You know, I think it, it it does in a sense, but I think all of these comparisons between Zimbabwe and Malawi ignore something that's really fundamental, which is that the military wanted to support uh, Lazarus Chapera in Malawi. If the military did not want to support him for whatever reason, right, we wouldn't have seen the same kind of transformation that we've seen. So this is similar to what happened in Zimbabwe in 2017. And perhaps the challenge in Zimbabwe is that Zimbabweans didn't go further to demand a transitional government in the moment, that citizens sort of left their fate to ZANU-PF. So what I would be interested in Malawi is, let's say you end up with a situation where the current president no longer represents people's interests, is the military going to step aside and let people's uh, choices be heard? I mean, I think that's a fair question um, that we need to pose to our colleagues in Malawi, that do they really believe that the, the military is now independent or is it that the military just favored uh, the guy who was running for office at that particular time? But it is true and, and it is fair to say that uh, Zimbabwe has become further militarized and, it's, and it will be very, very difficult to, uh, to, to sort of win, for, the, for any opposition to win against the current uh, ZANU-PF uh, because of military influence. I don't want to leave that question hanging out because I actually would like to know the answer to it. Uh, Boniface, what do you think? Um, I, I actually, you know, I, I do hear, you know, Chipo's concerns and, and the, uh, you know, her, her doubts about how sustainable this is. But if you go back in Malawi, even go back to 2012, the military also took a similar position when he, uh, again, at the time, after when Bing, the former president Bingo Mtarika died in office, there was an attempt to influence the military to take over power temporarily so that the then vice president would be set aside. But the military again said, look, the law, the constitution says the next in line is the vice president and that's what we stand for. So I'm somewhat more optimistic about the military really remaining in neutral and the I wouldn't think, I don't, I, don't think, I don't think if it's fair to characterize them as having favored the Chapera in even during the demonstrations. I think their position would be that they stood head and shoulders with the citizens, ordinary citizens in, you know, in, in maintaining the rule of law and that's what really mattered to them. Uh, I'm looking out of the corner of my eye and I see Idiot smiling there. So I wonder if she has a, an observation she'd like to make on this. I think that I would like to really align myself with uh, Chipo because the military, if you look at the 2015 general elections in Nigeria, the military seemed to actually have been neutral. But the 2019 elections was actually defined by the actions of the military and other security agents who actively participated in the elections process. So most of the, most of the uh, malpractices were 
perpetrated by the military, just like in the 2007 elections. So you see them even frontally in the collation center, disrupting elections, snatching ballot boxes. We saw a, at a point in time where the military and the police faced each other and were shooting into the air in rivers. But this was, not this was not what we saw in 2015. So the incursion of military into politics or into power at every point in time depends on their interest and the leadership that is actually in office. So I think that we should not be overtly optimistic and believe that because in Malawi at this point in time, they were very neutral, just as the judiciary were quite neutral and rejected bribes, that it will be a continuum, really. We should I think, and I think, I think that's a really good point. And I think it, it sort of leads to a broader point we could make, which is we often forget how many countries in Africa are still led by people who were military leaders or rebel leaders or are the first iteration of civilian leaders, but are effectively ruling what was a rebel party and has now become a civilian party. And because everywhere has multi-party elections and because everywhere has an officially civilian president, we kind of treat these as all being civilian regimes. Whereas if you think about Rwanda under Kagame, Uganda under Museveni, Zimbabwe, um, the role of the military is still so central or the form of rebel forces, but also you have leaders who are principally leaders because they won a conflict and then successively have won controlled authoritarian elections. But Hari in Nigeria is, of course, different. Uh, he was a military dictator. Then uh, he said he converted to democracy and then he won a multi-party election. So it's a different trajectory. But I did a study of this for my book, Democracy in Africa, a few years ago. And it was something like 40% of government in Africa were either run by a former military or rebel leader or had severe, serious kind of uh, role from the military in the cabinet and other aspects of politics. Um, and I think we forget that, right? You know, that's a significant constraint on any kind of democratization. So I think one of the things, you know, we're, we're asking this question about leadership change versus systemic change. I think as Chipo and Idiot have said, I think one of the most fundamental questions is, do you actually get the sense that this is really a civilian government and that it's, a, it's civilian issues that will determine things? And, and as Boney said, I think quite well, in Malawi, I really did, you know, I was here a lot around the last election, I really did get that sense here. Um, but as the other two have pointed out, those things can change very quickly. And that might not always be the case. You know, the military did, as Boney knows, get very politicized because the president started trying to change the leadership of the military to get somebody in who would be more pliant. Turns out that wasn't possible in the end, but there was a game played around politicizing the military. So I think, you know, as they've said, even in the case of Malawi, there's a constant need to be vigilant about politicizing the military and bringing it in. Because as Nigeria and Zimbabwe show us, once you do that, it's almost impossible to get the military back out. Nick, thanks for that. I, you know, I had one job to do and that was to keep the trains running on time and I failed miserably in that. Um, so I'm, I apologize for having to cut the conversation off, particularly as it begins to heat up. Um, but I hope it's an opportunity for all of us to get together at some other point um, and continue where we leave off here. I think it's been a fascinating discussion. I, I really am grateful to all of you for being here and for being a part of this, and particularly for staying over time uh, to join us along the way. Uh, just as a parting note for housekeeping, uh, our next BTI session uh, will be on September 9th, uh, 10 a.m. Eastern time in the United States. Uh, looking at economic disruption. So I hope you all will join us uh, for that. And again, I hope we can pick up this conversation at some point very soon because I, I think it's wonderful. And it's an opportunity for me to speak to you all again, which is selfishly something I'd like to do anyway. Uh, so to Nick, to Robert, Idayat, Chipo, and Boni, thank you all very much for being here. It's a pleasure having you and I welcome you back anytime. Talk to you soon. Bye now.